asked and asked me questions. So the week, this week and next week are pretty much just one lecture, which uh, are together focused on the economy of post-Soviet Central Asia. This week, we will talk about uh, the choices of economic transition that have been made in the region since 1992, whereas next week, we will go even more in detail and we will talk about uh, a particular economic aspect that is the um, energy politics of Central Asia. Obviously, like Russia, states like Kazakhstan and Turkmenistan have uh, enormous resources and the way in which these resources are explored, are processed, are exported is very important for the economy as a whole. But we couldn't really understand what's happening next week without really talking about uh, the, if you want, the background, the kind of infrastructure, the kind of infrastructure, theoretical as well, that we're going to uh, describe this week. So this week, the lecture has three main objectives. Uh, the first one uh, is uh, just the most important one, is trying to trace back, try to establish a connection between the economy of post-Soviet Central Asia and the economy of Soviet Central Asia. As I said to you last week, the state, like the Russian Federation, were once part of the Soviet Union. But unlike the Russian Federation, which was the center of the Soviet Union, these states were the periphery of the Soviet Union. So in that sense, we need to understand how that, perifer that peripheral state within the Soviet environment actually influenced the, the range of choices available to these post-Soviet states to establish independent policy making. So once we trace back this, um, this connection and we really reflect on whether or not Central Asia is a post-colonial environment, we then move back a step and we start to describe how the five republics have um, addressed the issue of economic de-Sovietization. So pretty much creation of a market uh, or a market economy. I mean, you guys for sure are familiar because you studied that you, most of you are from there, that in Russia, the 1990s, there was a constant research for policies that would allow these states to, uh, no, the Russian state to create a, function, a functioning economic uh, market economy. And we now, what we do in this week, we actually look at the same process, but in Central Asia and here, Obviously, I don't have the time to go into all the five systems, but I will have a look at one state that reformed a lot their economy, and that's Kyrgyzstan, and one state that did not reform the economy at all, Turkmenistan, in order to show to you how there were different options available to different states when it, when it came to uh, describe the uh, select, the pathway on which to embark to establish market economy in Central Asia. Then what we do, we have, we change our perspective and rather they keep talking about states, rather they keep talking about policies, we look at ordinary people. Uh, and here the issue is try to establish, to assess whether the politics of globalization impacted on ordinary Central Asians. And there will be a particularly important issue to uh, analyze in this particular section of the lecture. And it would be the issue of Central Asian migration in the Russian Federation. So you, know, you all know, I am not sure how many there are in Nizhny, but if you go to Moscow, if you go to Petersburg, you have a lot of Central Asians driving taxis, being nurses, serving you at the cafe. So it would be interesting to know from you at some point if there is this, the same situation in the region of the world. 
what this is not just because I am talking to a Russian to a Russian audience today or to a Russian based audience, but because it is particularly uh, crucial, if you want, to understand how the era of globalization helped ordinary Central Asian to escape the poverty, the destitution that they find at home because of very poor economic choices and allow them to move in significant groups. I mean, at any given day, there are 2 million Central Asians in the Russian Federation and uh, find a livelihood some, some, somewhere else. Obviously, this does not come with no problem. I mean, I am from Italy and I know very well, and Irina, who lived in Italy, know how the Calabrians did it as well. There, there is obviously some downsides in having large parts of the population going, going elsewhere. And in the Central Asia, we will focus on two issues. The first one is the economic aspect of this, which is uh, how does it feel? What kind of impact does it have uh, having a GDP mostly generated from abroad on the economic performance of a single state? But also what kind of impact that particular mm, migration pattern has on the uh, relationship state to state between the Russian Federation and the, um, and the Central Asian Republics in question. So uh, I will, as usually, I will speak for probably 40, 50 minutes, and then when there are questions, we can take them up. Uh, I usually prefer to speak less, but if there are any questions, of course, feel free to, uh, to, to either interrupt me or you can send a message, and I'm, I'm sure that Elisabetta can let me know that this is, this is happening. So this is the Soviet Union. This is the Soviet Union, and uh, rather than giving you the uh, administrative map of the Soviet Union with the 15 socialist Soviet republics, I am giving you the uh, maps, the map that illustrate visually the uh, economic region of the USSR. So now I am not sure how well you know the system in which the uni Soviet Union worked, but uh, all economic activities, this is in the post-Stalin era, were um, oversaw, overseen by the, the Ghost Plan. The Ghost Plan, which is the uh, state planning commission that was uh, located, situated in Moscow. The, la the latest HQ, uh, HQ headquarters was where now the Russia Duma is, so not far from, from the Kremlin. And um, the Ghost Plan was the organ that coordinated all, all of the um, economic activities of the Soviet Union. It would coordinate at union level with the ministries, Ministry of Industry, Ministry of Heavy Industry, Agriculture and Ministers, but also with the different Republican structure that would exist at SSR level. Um, interestingly, the, the, Russia, the RSFSR, the Soviet Russia, did not have a ghost plan because they used the one of the Soviet Union, whereas the, the other 14 republics had a um, ghost plan that was located in the different capitals. So in Kazakhstan was Almaty, Bishkek, Tashkent, and so on and so forth. So this ghost plan, as you know, uh, regulated the market economy, sorry, the, the Soviet economy, which was centrally planned. And in that system, every kind of production, every kind of uh, economic activity was regulated by the state. So quotas, volumes, possibility to exchange, intra-union trade, uh, intra-union subsidies were all regulated by the Soviet state. And uh, to this end, to maintain the system working, they established a, a system of cross subsidization across the Soviet Union, which means that it's not that each of the 15 state republics were meant to operate by themselves, but they were part of a single economic entity in which we, um, in which some states specialize in some production structures, some states specialize in other production structures, and at the end, the availability of goods and to some extent, even services, but mostly goods, 
were guaranteed by this system of intra-union trade. When we moved to Central Asia, we realized that this particular system had a um, very significant repercussion on the way in which the economy of Soviet Central Asia got to be structured. And the, the issue here is to understand that more sophisticated part of the union, Western Russia, uh, but also the, the, the Baltic states, and to some extent, the Ukrainian SSR, were more industrialized or hosted on their territories, more sophisticated industrial and agricultural installments, which made Central Asia uh, relegated, if you want, to the uh, extraction of raw materials, be it oil, be it gas, be it minerals, be it cotton, or be it cereals. So in that sense, the economy of Central Asia was essentially limited to the production of raw material that were either used to power the economy of other parts of the region, and that's particularly true for oil and gas, or were mm, used to uh, be then refined and uh, processed in other parts of the Union. A Central Asia in exchange would uh, obtain all of the good missing goods, all of those uh, particular um, elements that did not be produced through this intra-Union trade. And at the end of the Soviet Union, or the Soviet era, uh, Central Asia, the Central Asian republics were those uh, Soviet republics that pretty much only traded with other Soviet republics, which means that Kazakhstan would sell all, the Kazakh SSR would sell all of its oil and gas to the Russian, to, to the RSFSR or the Ukrainian SSR, for instance, and would import all the goods which it couldn't produce from other Soviet, Soviet republics. What does this map do? It illustrates how the union was divided in economic regions. So with, to allow the Gosplan to better coordinate this kind of uh, shared economic endeavor that was the Soviet economy. And as you would see from the map, we have each, uh, region 16, the Roman numbers, 16 and 17, being part of what we now understand as Central Asia. So we have uh, Kazakhstan being a self-standing economic region, number 17, at Central Asia proper, uh, what the Soviet uh, indicated with the adjective Sredni, Middle Asia, Sredni Asia, as the part of uh, the region which is formed by Turkmenistan, Uzbekistan, Kyrgyzstan, and Tajikistan. So to me, it's important that we understand that this division was not just artificial, but it kind of, um, it kind of um, supported the Soviet understanding of Central Asia at two separate entities. Kazakhstan, on the one end, Kazakhstan is much more is a Eurasian state proper, you have a very large Russian population, and the rest of the region, which is part of a more traditional, if you want more Asian, uh, history and shared uh, progress. And this is something which is very important because uh, artificially, but not insignificantly, actually reproduces at economic level, the division between traditionally nomad uh, and tradition and uh, more sedentary people living in, in the region. Sorry, I'll, I'll go back for a second here. And I'd like you to continue to reflect on this very important dichotomy, very important division between Central Asia nomads and Central Asia sedentary people, because it will return in the final lecture of these four, namely the one that which uh, focus on, focuses on Islam. So let me just give you a, um, a quick four or five minutes continuation of uh, discussion on uh, Central Asia in the Soviet era. The graph, sorry, the, the table which I put onto your 
your screen now. It's taken away from this very famous book, which we use in the West. It's called The Soviet Middle East, question mark, a model for development, which is a book that uh, Alec Nov and J.A. Newt, which used to be in my department 30, 40 years ago in Glasgow, wrote to describe how Central Asia was, um, was regulated, was governed, was ruled during the Soviet time. And what does this map do? Uh, it does show to you, and here is both Central Asia and the Caucasus Republics, it shows to you in the immediate post-Stalin era, so 50s to early 60s, uh, how um, Central Asia, the Central Asian Republics did contribute to the wider uh, Soviet economy. And uh, in order to achieve two ends, the first one, it uh, established very clearly the relationship that I mentioned before, namely that uh, between the economic specialization of one region and the um, economic production that this region makes to, to the old Soviet Union, but also shows the gap of economic development existing between the four, sorry, the five republics. And what do you see by looking at this data? You look at this data and you realize that there is a uh, particularly uh, marked division between the economic performance, the economic capacity, the economic power of, of Soviet Kazakhstan, the Kazakh SSR, and those of the other four republics. Kazakhstan, unlike the other republics, was able to uh, produce uh, significant, well, some significant industrial production, but also some uh, relatively major um, agricultural production. You see the difference between collective farm and state farm there as well in, 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 the, in the fourth and the fifth column there. And it was certainly the most developed of um, those republics. And together with Georgia, those were the two most uh, developed, the more economically advanced, the most sophisticated economies of the Central Asia and the Caucasus, which is generally perceived as being the um, periphery of the Soviet Union. So to me, this, this graph, even though it clearly shows, it, it, it has to be contained to the, the Stalin era. So in that sense, it's not fresh data, but it, it takes a snapshot of what happened um, at a particularly important watershed in Soviet times. Um, it also captures visually very clearly the dynamics of economic specialization. And uh, it shows that the structure of the economic of the Soviet economy, the logic of central planning, the necessities inscribed into Gauss plan uh, rule, if you want, limited the capacity of this state to uh, expand the economic horizon to a significant extent. And of course, this worked up until the Soviet Union existed. I mean, I always say my students, in the, ma in the mind of the Soviet leaders, the Soviet Union were never meant to break down, but then it collapsed in, in the early 90s. So that system was a very peculiar one, was functioning to the extent to which it was existing. Uh, this, the logic of Cross subsidies, the logic of intra Republican trade, the logic of artificial party, artificial quota, artificial volumes regulated by a central planning actually ceased to exist the very minute at which this central planning body ceased to exist. So, with the collapse of the Soviet Union, all of the benefits that were part of Soviet, uh, of being part of the Soviet Confederation, collapsed overnight. So, it, this, this graph. Sorry, this, this figure all actually shows to you that there is a particularly uh, limited, if you want, uh, range for uh, reform uh, available to the states because the structure of the economy was very much anchored to the participation in the, the Soviet Confederation. Before we move on to the next slide, which looks at uh, 
economic choices made in post-Soviet Kyrgyzstan and Turkmenistan, respectively. I think that there is a fairly important question which we need to address and a question which I hope you can reflect uh, when you do some kind of thinking about this lecture during the week. Uh, was the relationship between the Russian, Soviet Russia and Soviet Central Asia articulated in colonial terms? To some extent, was the Soviet Union, when it was seen for Central Asia, an exercise in coloniality? Well, to me, the answer is both yes and no. I know it's not a very sophisticated answer, but that, that's it. On the one hand, yes, we do have this kind of uh, relationship mm, in which uh, there was a conquest, there was an, uh, uh, some kind of imposition of values from above, uh, there was a, a kind of imposition also of economic specialization that were meant to satisfy the whole rather than the individual state. So you would see by looking at especially those dynamics of um, inter-regional subsidies, economic specialization, that yes, there was a particularly colonial element here. But on the other hand, we cannot deny that the Soviet Union had a particularly important um, element of progress, element of development, element of modernization onto the, the, the Central Asian Republics, which means that the Soviet Union was not a merely colonial enterprise. The Soviet Union was also a highly ideological enterprise. And as part of this enterprise, they had this idea that traditional structure, traditional constraints, uh, issue on the development of nomadism, of economic, um, if you want, of obliterating uh, economic uh, basic structure needs to be eliminated and transformed this kind of uh, extreme part. I mean, Central Asia was always the Soviet frontier. So Central Asia was for Soviet Union, what the Wild West was for, for, the, for the Americans the, in, 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 the, in, in the 19th century. That this frontier need to be changed, need to be developed, need to be transformed. And there is also one more thing, which I think is it, it, it's, very, it's very significant that if you look at the Baltic states, you will find a particularly interesting um, debate about how to understand the, uh, the Soviet era, how to, uh, how to make sense of the way in which local population interacted with the Soviet leadership and the Soviet state. Whereas in Central Asia, we haven't got this debate. There was no such thing as a uh, thirst for independence, there was no such, such a thing for emancipation from the Soviet Union, mm, either at a little level or a popular level, we, which makes me think that when we understand the, so, the colonial, what we want to assess the colonial composition of the Soviet Central Asia interaction, we have to be really clear about the fact that there was a very significant, a substantial, and also a very committed local class of communists or Soviet leaders who interacted with the Moscow uh, party to de develop Soviet century. So in that sense, it is not colonial as only because it clearly shows to you that there was a participation of local Central Asians in the Soviet enterprise. This is not to say that was all perfect. No, it was far from it. But there is a lot of literature, especially produced in the United States, which continues to explain all of the problems of Central Asia by saying, oh, Stalin did that, Khrushchev did that, as if the local people, the local elites, the local leaders, local communists had no role at all. And that's simply not true. In the demarcation of the states, in the in carrying out of the economic um, operation of the USSR, in carrying out the way in which Soviet Central Asia came out on development to be transformed to the experiment of Soviet development, as Artemy Kalinowski says, um, there was a very conspicuous role played by the Soviet, the Soviet Central Asians, so the local elite. And this is something which we haven't really seen in post-colonial environment because 
we will ne we never had in Central Asia the condemnation of these people as collaborators. I mean, one of the most important politicians, even now, in the history of Kazakhstan is the Mohammed Kunayev, who was the long-term first secretary of the Kazakh Communist Party in Soviet time. Uh, the, 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 the last, the, the last uh, Soviet leaders of the Kazakh SSR, the Uzbek SSR, and the Turkmen SSR became president independent. And actually they became um, very popular just because they were the first. So without really having any kind of denunciation of how this uh, relationship between the, uh, the, the center and the periphery was done. So in some sense, I would say that this slide only offers you some kind of um, initial, if you want, insight onto this very long discussion about this. And the argument which I use, you know, like this is both yes and no colonial, is something which Alec Nov and you really explain very well in that book. The book is called The Soviet Middle East, a model for development question mark. So now I think that in the next two slides, I really focus on this economic transition. And what I'm gonna to say to you is the destruction, the, co the collapse, the obliteration of the Soviet system actually uh, complicated enormously the lives of the independent Central Asian economic policy makers because they were constrained by the structure of production that was bequeathed, so they, was, they, they inherited from the Soviet Union. And uh, here there is a very important distinction that we need to make, something which we will find next week as well. The fact that uh, if your economy is specialized in the production of raw materials, you are going to be more successful if your availability of these raw materials is much larger. So, States like independent Kazakhstan and independent Turkmenistan were relative big winners of the Soviet disintegration because they were able to export at market prices, not at Soviet prices, the very large um, resources that they have, or both in Kazakhstan and thus Turkmenistan, respectively. So, in that sense, states with what we call energy largesse, so a lot of resources, abundance of resources like the Russian Federation, were able to um, exit the Soviet Union with some more success. The problem, though, it comes when we move to uh, economic landscape like Kyrgyzstan's, where there is no significant resources. Let me have a glass of water and then I'm going to explain what this graph is about. So I went to the World Bank website and I found data of GDP rise and growth and GDP growth actually in uh, across the last 20, 25 years in Kyrgyzstan and Turkmenistan. The, if you can see it, there is a line which is darker blue is more stable. That's the Kyrgyzstan line. Whereas the one with peaks and troughs is the Turkmenistan one. So these two states are quite different. Turkmenistan, the fourth largest producer of natural gas in the world, relatively small population, relatively isolated, um, and as we will see, not very interested in reforms. Kyrgyzstan, on the other hand, situated at the other side of Central Asia, uh, in the state where there is no oil or gas, the population is relatively dense compared to, 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 to Turkmenistan only in absolute terms. And where, unlike the Turkmen context, the president of the 1990s, with, who was Askar Akayev, decided to engage in significant economic reforms in order to adjust fairly swiftly, fairly quickly, rapidly, the market economy inherited from the Soviet times into something more, more than if you want, more 
ready for relative marketization and globalization. So let's move from, from to Kyrgyzstan. So in the 1990s, the Askar Akayev government moved into a uh, pro program of extensive privatization. So assets, companies, factories that were owned by the state in Soviet time, because that's how it was, were sold to private investors. And uh, unlike the Russian case, this extensive privatization system was actually uh, concluded without really creating large conglomerates of economic power, what they call the oligarch. And why? First of all, because there wasn't much to sell. I mean, one thing is selling Transneft, Rosneft, Rost, Gazprom, and one thing is selling the small Kurds, Kyrgyz enterprises. But also because uh, th there wasn't the mm, very close relationship between the Akaya government, government, government and independent economic actor, which we actually saw in Russia in the, in the Yeltsin era, especially in the 1996 election and so on. So this privatization was on the one end a success because it avoided the establishment of a Kyrgyz oligarchy class, but on the other, it led to a significant concentration of uh, poverty. So we had a lot of people who lost the assets, it was triple the assets. And at the end of the program, you had 75% of the population living uh, under condition of poverty, more or less. And this would increase even more in the rural context. That's always very important in Central Asia. One thing are the city, one thing is, is the countryside. It's very similar in Russia, but in Central Asia is even more uh, pronounced because we know that the money goes into urban center. So this uh, extensive privatization took the state out of the Kyrgyz uh, economic activity, made sure that there was some kind of development, but it was a, a, pro, a, a process that was regulated by very neoliberal uh, principles. The IMF, the World Bank, that kind of uh, austerity-driven, uh, debt-obsessed policy, which forced a lot of the people of Central, a lot of people of Central Asia, sorry, of Kyrgyzstan, to lose their assets because the state has to cut their own role. The rise of poverty was, of course, a consequence. What's important about this is that um, we've seen another complication emerging in those years. Uh, in November 1993, uh, what they called the Rublevaya Zona, the Ruble Zone, collapsed. Collapsed, and those republics, including the Russian Federation, who used either the Soviet ruble or the Russian ruble as a joint uh, currency, stopped doing that. So only Russia kept the ruble. And all of the Central Asian republics, Caucasian republics, and so on and so forth, create their own uh, currency, independent currency, which in the case of Kyrgyzstan was named the SOM. And having a sudden, talking about shocks, a very sudden change of currency is a big problem in the short term. Because if I trade with you with the same currency, you recognize my reserves. If I change my currency, I lose my reserves when I trade with you. And that's a big obstacle to trade. And another factor that constrained Kyrgyz economic development and progress in the early 2000s. If you move uh, further down the, the list of issues which we need to discuss, I think that uh, there are two key uh, markers, two key factors which we need to take into consideration if we are to assess uh, Kyrgyzstan's economic uh, performance after the collapse of the Soviet Union, but most importantly, after this uh, extensive process of economic reform privatization conducted in the 1990s. The first one is that the state continues to spend a lot of money to achieve its energy security. This is a poor state, does not have oil and gas. The winters are very cold. 
and it needs to somewhat um, power its economy. So if you want to industrialize, you need oil. If you want to have a better transport system, you need oil and gas. If you want to have a safer and more energy effective and efficient uh, heating system in, in the residential homes, you need natural gas. So these are not coming, these resources are not coming easy to Kyrgyzstan. And to me, it's important to understand that energy poverty, which is the population lack to access to a safe and adequate uh, and constant energy uh, flow is something that is very crucial to Kyrgyzstan's uh, economy now. And uh, the failure to transform the local energy production, which we will see next week more in detail, the failure to ensure that these, that these imports are constant has actually generated a very significant uh, energy poverty at first, but also has forced the people to go into the streets and protest against this issue. The 2010 Kyrgyz revolution, the one before the one with last year, was actually very much instigated by the population discontent with the scarce, irregular, inadequate access to energy issues, to energy resources that we saw. So if you look at a very similar uh, development, there was this campaign in Armenia called Electric Yerevan. We had the same applicated in Bishkek. The other, uh, if you want, marker that defined Kyrgyzstan post-Soviet economic performance is the fact that the failure to increase economic performance, as you would see, the line is pretty flat on the graph underneath, the failure to instigate um, some kind of industrialization, the failure to offer perspective of employment to the people of Kyrgyzstan has actually resulted in the uh, large uh, migration of large parts of the Kyrgyz community, as we will see in the next slide, to the Russian Federation. And we have now a context in which at any given time, there are a lot of Kyrgyz, half a million at least, into the Russian Federation, mostly in, in Petersburg, I understand. And um, those are actually uh, sending so much money back to Kyrgyzstan that a, a large chunk, and there are the, the figures in the next slides, is, um, or the Kyrgyz GDP, is actually produced in the Russian Federation. Now, that wouldn't be a problem in a perfect system, but nothing is perfect in the world. So if Russia has an instance of economic crisis, and they have in the past, the money that gets sent back to Kyrgyzstan collapses. So if Russia sneezes, Kyrgyzstan gets the flu, the fever. And this interconnection between the Russia's economic performance and Kyrgyzstan uh, uh, internally produced GDP is something that is very much constraining and linking up very closely the two economies of uh, these two states. Now, let's move to the other state, the state on the right hand side and the one with the lighter blue uh, line onto the, the slide, that Turkmenistan. Turkmenistan is a gas dependent economy. Turkmenistan is a proper, as we will see next week, a proper rentier state. Its economy is mostly uh, supported by the export of mm, one single product, the natural gas, and much of the budget, much of the much of the uh, much of Turkmenistan's economic performance is connected to the state capacity to generate external revenues by exporting and selling this gas, which is, as we'll see next week, a particularly uh, dangerous situation to be in at time at which prices fluctuate. So Turkmenistan, unlike uh, Kyrgyzstan, never engaged in privatization reforms after the Soviet Union collapse. In fact, Turkmen SSR produced gas, independent Turkmenistan continue to produce gas. So there hasn't been a structural and extensive, a comprehensive um, transformation of the economic activity of post-Soviet Turkmenistan which has created a particular context in which the, the state 
pardon, is happy, is happy to continue surviving onto this, uh, the export of this rent, but so, or this gas, so the generation of the external, external rent. I mean, Turkmenistan has got very low taxation. Turkmenistan used to have a lot of subsidies. And, but dependence on the gas situation, on a gas uh, largesse, when you don't have access to either LNG capacity, the capacity to transform is your gas into liquefied natural gas, which cannot be put on the train, or if you add an open sea onto the ship, which they don't have in Central Asia, has got a particular, got too many issues. The first one is that you are dependent to export your gas and ends to sustain your overall economic activity to engage in large scale, far flung, very expensive pipeline projects. So, to Manistan to export its gas needs to have a lot of money invested in the construction of pipeline. Next week, we will see how this has, policy has failed, creating at first a monopoly of Russian over of the Gazprom, particularly over the, the transit of gas, and now a China monopoly, monopoly, you say, in, in the context on the purchase of, 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 of Turkmen gas. But I just want to make a point here is that one of the things, one of the factors that uh, entrenched, if you want, Turkmenistan's dependence on um, gas in the first 50 years was the fact that there was already a pipeline available, the Central Asia Central Pipeline. We will see next week on the map, but this pipeline connects Turkmenistan going to Kazakhstan into the Russian Federation. And it allowed for 20 years, without doing that much work, the constant export of relatively significant volumes of gas, which means that in this context, the um, existence of an infrastructure network that was on the one hand constraining Turkmenistan because it was only exported to Russia, but on the other one, on the other hand, facilitating the export to the Russian Federation actually entrenched this situation in which the elite was happy, but just maintaining that kind of minimum amount of decent amount of revenues, didn't engage a reform, a rules, of course, with a non-transparent, kleptocratic, corrupt outlook on the back of these revenues that were part of the, um, of the export of natural gas. Obviously, when the context became more entrenched, and when people like Niyazov and Bedi Mohamedov later on came to be uh, very much in control, they increased the political isolation of Turkmenistan because they always been very obsessed about their possibility to keep the country not engaged in international affairs in order to preserve the domestic property, domestic monopoly. And what did they do? They limited through this obsession with isolation, they export options. For, this will be ex ex explained much more in depth next week. The point I want to make here is that the logic of authoritarian politics, as we were saw last week in Central Asia, particularly in the Turkmen case, has a very important, very central role to play in interpreting the transition from the Soviet economy to the post-Soviet economy. Now, let me just move to the final slide so then we can finally have questions. And what do we have here? So, we are now living in the, I mean, the post-Soviet era, 30 years this year since the Soviet Union collapsed. And at the same time, another way to describe, um, well, another process that concurrently happened through the era of de de-Sovietization is the issue of globalization. So I'm sure you know what it is. I'm not going to spend time on definition, but what am I interested here, rather than describing the, the opportunities that globalization has offered the Central Asian states, I am more interested in seeing the impact that these opportunities has had onto the, the um, ordinary Central Asians. Now, uh, obviously, the instigation of Central Asians, as I was saying before, of, sorry, of dynamics of um, authoritarian economic control, of uh, poverty, of inequality, generated an economic landscape in which 
the gap between the elite and the ordinary people, what you will call the, the wider population, is quite large. Issues of inequality, as we also see, you know, the post-Soviet economies into the Russian Federation, is an issue of rural poverty are very present when it comes to describe Central Asia performance in the post-Soviet Union, particularly Soviet era, particularly in states that are not energy rich, which is Kyrgyzstan and Tajikistan, and to a lesser extent, Uzbekistan, we'll see next week what kind of context they have. So the poorest economies where they are not very much of a prospect of um, employment or welfare or a decent life forced people to migrate. And especially uh, in, the 20, in the 2000s, so after Vladimir Putin came to power the first time in 1999, uh, Russian economy was booming. It was the performance was quite impressive, powered by this very significant rise of prices, a very significant uh, expansion of the um, well, Russia generated an economy which was very much powered by uh, the export of oil and gas, instigating also situation which we've seen in other parts of the Middle East, for instance, where think about Dubai, think about Saudi Arabia, where you have a large group of migrants moving into the ranty economy, to the oil economy, and doing the works that local people no longer want to do. And we've seen Particularly, I was saying, after the Lenin Putin came to power the first time, lots of Central Asia moving into the Russian Federation. And at any given time, we have 2 million Central Asia, mostly. We, we, we can only assume this because the Russian Migration Service no longer offers kind of um, precise fig figures, figures on this. There are 2 million, two million uh, Central Asia in, 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 in Russia, uh, mostly Uzbek, particularly Uzbek, uh, Kyrgyz and Tajik, and obviously they located in uh, predominant in urban centers, Uzbe uh, sorry, Kyrgyz in, in St. Petersburg, Uzbek in Russian and Tajik a little bit anywhere else. They quite a significant community also in Yekaterinburg. And we see from the, from the graph on the right hand side of the slide uh, that uh, particularly in the early 2010s. So you could, you could figure that, what does the graph do? The graph tells you which percentage of the GDP or the gross domestic product of economies in the Caucasus and in Central Asia was generated by money remitted, sent back by the migrants. As you would see, places like Kyrgyzstan and Tajikistan in particular reached peaks of 25 in the case of Kyrgyzstan or 40% in the case of Kyrgyzstan or Tajikistan of remittances of a GDP production, which, as I said before, created this particular context in which um, you link up very significantly, very closely, almost too closely, the Central Asian economies to the economy of, of the receiving state, which is in this case is the Russian Federation. So, Obviously, uh, you have, it's easy it, it to understand what's the economic uh, consequences of this extreme dependency. But I'll just have a look for, for a minute of, um, at the human dimension of this. What happens if you don't leave? Well, if you don't leave, particularly if you are originating from rural Tajikistan, rural Kyrgyzstan, there is not much to do. You end up having a life in which there are no prospects, there are not uh, possibilities of, of not even a decent life. So uh, you, you also have all this kind of health issues, mental issues associated with destitution at all. Well, if you don't leave then, if you do leave, if you go to Russia, if you go somewhere else, obviously in this day and age, the treatment of migrants abroad is something which is kind of uh, always controversial. We see it in Australia, we see it in the US, we see it in the UK, and we saw it in Russia as well, where, 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 where there is some group of people which are not always welcoming of people of colors different from their for, for, for skin different from for Russia, but also for, for particular parts in particular historical time, maybe four or five years ago was more pronounced, in which there was an issue of xenophobia towards Central Asians. But let's move a, a little bit from this 
and let's see how the status of migration is recognized. It's always very, very problematic. The boundaries between legality and illegality, it's always very complicated. You have central agents who prefer not to be uh, regularized by the Russian, the Russian state. They live this life of constant uncertainty, constant insecurity, uh, and they don't really want to get the documents because it's complicated. Is uh, you encounter corruption requests, it's never pleasant. So what actually happens on the one hand, you have this large population, a part of it lives in, the, in this gray area of illegal slash legal immigration. But on the other hand, the possibility of regularizing relation that this large uh, parts portion of migrants is actually something which has very much influenced, and that's my last point before I finishing up, the relationship between Central Asia and the Russian Federation. In 2015, Kyrgyzstan entered as a full member the Eurasian Economic Union. And using an argument that was used in my own country in the 1970s, when Italy decided to uh, enter in this kind of, no, well, to support the economic project, the, the European Union, Kyrgyzstan placed the regularization of the state, of the status of these migrants at the core of the foreign policy. Entering, if you are part of the um, Eurasian Union, there is freedom of labor in the Union. So in the five economies, Russia, Belarus, Kazakhstan, Kyrgyzstan, and, and Armenia, that are part of the, so, of the Eurasian Union, have a freedom of labor which means that if I have a job offer and a contract for somewhere in one of these five countries, I can move without immigration complication. So the minute that Kyrgyzstan entered the, um, the Eurasian Union, th those migrants who had uh, legal, legal status in the Russian Federation became regularized on any kind of circumstances. And that's a consideration very important when you have a million people living somewhere else and you don't want them to return because what can you offer into an economic place? From what I am aware, a very similar discussion is being held at the moment in some parts of the Uzbek government, where the Uzbekistan could access as a full member the Eurasian Union and then regularize the uh, large part of the Uzbek communities of migrants which live and work in the Russian Federation. So you can see, even if we have looked at this issue, and we could, have, we could go more into this into the Q&A if you have questions, uh, from an ordinary people perspective, the numbers are so big, are so significant, the economic dimension of this is so important that you end up having an, an inevitable re repercussion of this uh, Russian Central Asia relationship, even at state level. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much for your lecture. That was very interesting, especially the, your last points about globalization. So it's very uh, close to our reality and we totally understand what you're talking about. Uh, well, we don't have questions in the chat so far. Maybe uh, someone wants to ask them out loud. You can unmute yourself and maybe someone has some comments, some Maybe you want to ask our lecturer to repeat something, just anything, any feedback, you're very welcome. Well, anyone? Yeah, they say thank you. So as our lecturer told us, uh, that uh, was just the first part. And next time, right, we have the, uh, uh, you will continue the topic and maybe uh, maybe after the second part, our guests will have questions. No problem at all. Yeah, if you can look at the chat, Luca, they say thank you very much for the lecture. Yeah, yeah. 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 So thank that's all for you. Thank you very much. Okay.
Yeah, I think that <clears throat> uh, Luca actually gave a lot of information. So maybe during the first lecture, there were more questions, maybe also because of the topic itself. But here you exposed actually all the um, <clears throat> details of uh, the topic. That, that's why. I also would like to stress the attention that uh, Dr. Anceski is also the project manager of uh, the Erasmus Mundus uh, program in Central European Eurasian and Russian Studies. Uh, so it's the project and the program that is run in the consortium uh, of uh, eight universities um, um, headed by the University of Glasgow and uh, from our side, uh, this is the Faculty of Social Sciences that uh, host a part of this program. Uh, so we really appreciate this collaboration and uh, the contribution of Dr. Anceski uh, to the, uh, our academic life. So thank you very much, uh, Luca. Um, we will be happy to continue our uh, discussion and lectures next week. Actually, we have to fix um, because the next. Oh, week, it, 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 I just got one question. It I received it in my personal message, so yeah. I can just read it. Uh, the question was about what structures were implemented by the government during the peak of xenophobia. No, this is something which uh, is very interesting. Uh, what happens to the migrants in Russia or elsewhere is not something that the government of Kyrgyzstan, Tajikistan really care about. They are not protecting their citizens. They're not really interested in what's going on because they haven't got the capacity of looking after all of them. Uh, so obviously when there are homicides, when there are casualties or when people have got really, really badly hurt, they had to repatriate, but in general terms, um, the situation was always kind of uh, not talked about. Uh, I mean, it's not that the governments don't care about what these migrants do, but it's also kind of, it's good for these governments that these people are not in Tajikistan, not in Kyrgyzstan, because you would have a lot of unemployment resulting from that. You would have a lot of problems with these people being back. So returning is not something which is mostly an option for, this, for the Central Asian governments. And to me, this is reverberated, is very visible in the way in which these um, Central Asian states did uh, react. They never created much of a problem uh, when in relationship with Putin, when those ep episodes went in. So uh, it is kind of a, of a gray area. I recognize that it's something which I, uh, I should look more into it, but to me, it's always, uh, you got this very big division between we want them to go and we don't want them to come back. So whatever happens in Russia, it's fine with us. It's, it's very significant that a, a great part of the economy of Kyrgyzstan and Tajikistan is actually off offset to Russia. And that's something which is, uh, it's, it's, it it's the same in Bangladesh and in the Philippines. Uh, so it is very, very, very significant. And I think that there is, I'm sure there is also in Russia a lot of research on this, but the state level, we never, we never seen a big probe, a big fuss being created by the government of Kyrgyzstan and Tajikistan to um, protect, if you want, those migrants. Yeah, okay, thank you. Um, Luca, again, you were talking about uh, the next lecture. Yeah, uh, the next lecture, uh, according to our, our schedule, actually, <laughs> was supposed to be the 23rd of February, but uh, Luca, uh, 23rd here is the holiday. So... Uh, uh, I can do one even in March. I don't really mind. Ah. So I, uh, next week we can take it off and then we can do 2nd of March and 9th of March. If it's okay with you, I get no problems with that. 9th of March, uh, Elizabeth taken into consideration the 8th of March, that is holiday also, how it's 9th of March. Uh, I think it's also a day off. Okay. Well, I'm happy to go up to the 16th. I don't really mind. I, I kept all the Tuesdays free. Okay, okay, okay. So, so maybe not next week. We can, we can do the following week. 
So okay. the second of March, and then we can have another week off and we can go on the 16th of Perfect. March. I don't really mind. Okay, okay. So okay. we have too many holidays in uh, February and March. <laughs> But, but uh, because Tuesday works for me, I have holidays coming into the... Okay, okay, yeah. perfect. Okay. Anyway, dear guests, we will uh, inform you by email about the date of the next lectures. Don't worry, you won't miss it. No problem. Okay. Okay, thank you all. And, and if any student got any question, they can always email me on my Glasgow email. Okay. Okay. Thank you very much, everyone. Okay. Have a nice day. Goodbye. Bye. Bye. Bye.